Hello guys and welcome back to my channel. Today in this video I'm going to check the new 2.4 GHz FPV line of products from Furious FPV. In this video I'm going to go over each of these products and soon I'm going to finally build the Gepro C Mark II 7 inch quadcopter and then I'm going to use the 2.4 GHz VTX and head doors and test it out. Now first of all each of these products is being sold separately so you don't have to buy everything together. However if you buy it separately it's going to cost you about $230 and if you're going to buy the combos that Furious FPV offer it's going to save you $35. So basically in the line of 2.4 GHz products from Furious FPV we can find the antennas which I'm going to get to in a moment and we can find the receiver and the VTX. The VTX is also available in an FCC version and also European version. I've got the unlimited one which has a selectable output strength of 25, 200, 500 and 800 milliwatts. The 2.4 GHz receiver is identical to the 5.8 GHz one and without turning them on you won't be able to tell them apart. In addition, it's available in two versions, so you can either get one that is compatible with the standard FetchUck module bay, and you can also get a version which is compatible with FetchUck Attitude goggles. Along with the 2.4 GHz receiver, we're also getting this adapter, which are 45 and 90 degrees male SML to female SMA adapters. Now, in case you're wondering, of course, the 2.4 GHz receiver is compatible with the docking, and in this video, I'm going to hook it up and show you how it looks. So now let's check the VTX. So along with the 2.4 GHz VTX, we're getting a spare heat shrink, the user manual and also this bag that contains a camera adapter and also a straight and 90 degrees AMCX to SMA antenna adapters. Now even though at the first sight this VTX looks a little big, it's actually not that big. You can see how it compares next to the AKK FX2 Ultimate Mini. So it's just a little bigger and in terms of weight it weighs 9.5 grams and the FX2 Ultimate Mini weighs 7.3 grams. So 2.2 grams is not a big difference. So let's measure it up and the dimensions are about 37.6 by 25.7 by 9 millimeters. This VTX supports 16 channels so we can see the frequency table over here. In addition you can set it up between 25, 200, 500 and 800 millivolts and you can set up the VTX either by using this button over here or you can also use the VTX peripherals wire which is connected to the flight controller. I assume that it's going to work the same as Smart Audio, but unfortunately it's not supported at the moment and according to Furious FPV it's going to be available on one of the next updates. In addition, this VTX features an MMCX antenna connector, it has a built-in LC filter and the walk-in voltage is between 7 to 26 volts. After going over the antennas, I'm going to show you how the setup works and I'm also going to measure the output strength. So of course, if you're going to decide to go with 2.4 GHz VTX and RX, you're going to need to get antennas. And I recommend to get the three of them. Of course, you can use just two cloverleaf antennas, one for the receiver and one for the VTX. But for optimal range, it's also recommend to get the patch antenna. So now let's open the boxes. You can see that the packages comes packed pretty carefully because you don't want to bend the leaves of the antennas. So over here, I've got this 2.4 GHz cloverleaf antenna. These antennas are available in both RCP and LCP versions, so just make sure to get two identical antennas because RCP is not going to work well with LCP. The second antenna is the same antenna, just with an AM6 antenna connector, so this one is going to be connected to the VTX and this one is going to be connected to the receiver. As you may tell, these antennas are a little bit bigger than the 5.8 GHz antennas and this is one of the disadvantages of moving to 2.4 GHz. You can also see that the patch antenna is a little bit bigger, but this is actually not that bad. So for the receivers, it's not going to be critical, but you can see that this antenna is a little bit fragile and it's not cheap as well. It costs $20, so if you're going to put it on your racing quadcopter on a hard crash and even on a minor one, it can be bent and it can be easily broken. But of course, this is kind of misses the purpose of this set because after all you're probably going to get this set for a long range quadcopter or a long range wing so this is not going to be suitable for small or mini quadcopters which you're probably not going to fly for more than 500-600 meters tops. Just to show you how big are these antennas you can see this is an omnidirectional antenna from Furious FPV next to the 2.4 GHz one and you can see how these antennas compare and you can see that the 2.4 GHz antennas are much bigger. So let's weigh up the antennas. The receiver antenna weighs 11 grams and the VTX antenna weighs 6.6 grams. Now I've got everything connected so let's first power on the receiver and now the 3D 2.4 GHz receiver is loading. 
Pressing the menu button is going to display the menu. You're also going to see it on your FV goggles. Then you can browse between the saved channels. You have eight options. In order to modify setting, you will need to long press the center button and then you can change the channel, save it, delete, or move the channel. And you can also, of course, exit this menu. Then you can browse between all the channels. So you can see we have 16 available channels. We can also perform a search, which is going to scan between all the channels. We can enter band scanner mode, which is going to do a continuous scan between the channels. Now it's not going to find anything because the VTX is not on. But as you can see, after powering it up, now it found the best signal on channel A8. After turning it off, now the line is flat again. So of course you can also see it on the small screen of the receiver. We can exit this mode by just pressing the up or down buttons. You can also pause the scan if you'd like. And let's head back. You can also enter settings mode. If you want, you can also restore the default settings. So you'll have to press and hold while selecting the restore option. In addition, you can also adjust the OSD layout and you can exit the main menu. On the screen of the receiver, we can see the current channel. We can see the RSSI, which is empty because nothing is received. We can see the call sign, the temperature, and the voltage of the battery. So now I'm going to quickly show you how to configure this VTX. Now I've got the VTX powered up. And at the moment of shooting this video, as I mentioned before, the only way to configure this VTX is by using this button. So just refer to this diagram that is going to enable you to select the channel, band, and also the output strength. And by the way, you can also configure two LED strips that are connected on this end and this end of the VTX. But in this video, I'm not going to go through the procedure of connecting LED strips. Now short pressing, this button is going to tell you which channel band and output strength is correctly set. Blue is going to indicate the channel, green the band, and red the output strength. So let's press it. Now the blue LED indicator flashed once, so as the green and also the red, which means that we are on channel 1, band A, and the output strength is 25 milliwatts, even though I'm getting about 100 milliwatts. In order to set up the channel band and the output strength, you're going to need to short press this button and then long press it for about two seconds. Now you could see that the LED flashed in pink color twice, which means that now we are on setup mode. So we can set up the channel. Each time that you press this button, it's going to increase the channel. And the number of times that the blue LED flashes indicates the channel. So we can see that now we are on channel seven, I think. Let's count it again. Now it's eight. And now we are back to channel one. Then long pressing this button again for about two seconds is going to take you to the band option. And now the green LED indicator flashes once, which means that we are on channel A. And now it flashes twice, which means that we are on channel B. Moving on to the output strength selection is done again by long pressing this button for two seconds. And then we can set up the output strength. When the red LED indicator flashes once, it means that it's on 25 milliwatt, twice for 200 milliwatt three times for 500 milliwatts, and finally four times for 800 milliwatts. You know, to save your selection, you're going to need to long press this button for five seconds, and then your settings are going to be saved. So again, when it's set to 25 milliwatts, I'm getting 110 milliwatts. When the VTX is set to 200 milliwatts, I'm getting about 325 milliwatts. When it's set to 500 milliwatts, I'm getting about 350 milliwatts. And finally, when it's set to 800 milliwatts, I'm getting about 500 milliwatts. Now, by the way, one thing that I didn't mention before is that three times that the LED is going to flash in pink color is going to indicate that your changes were saved. So now, for example, let's say I would like to set it back to 25 milliwatt. You can see that now the LED flashes once. So let's save the setting by long pressing this button for five seconds. You could see that now it flashed three times on pink color and now it's set to 25 milliwatt, which is actually 110 milliwatts. Now I did have some issues with this LED indicator where it just didn't turn on and the VTX was working and I made sure and the way to solve it was to just power off the VTX, disconnect both antennas and this connector and leave it disconnected for about a couple of minutes and then it solved the problem and I'm going to ask first a few what is the problem and maybe they can figure it out. So if it happens to you, don't worry, your VTX is probably still working and the power indication is still going to work. So it's going to tell you that the VTX is working and you can still configure it using the VTX button, but it's going to be very hard to configure it without the LED indicator. So now I've got everything powered up. The VTX is set to A1. 
So now I'm going to power the receiver. Now it's on B5, so we can perform a search. It's going to scan now between all the available 16 channels. And now when it's done, it's going to display the channels that have the highest RSSI. Now, even though the channel is A1, you can see that the first option is B5, so always double check the channel that you're currently on. Let's select A1. And as you can see, we can see the picture clearly on the screen. By the way, after selecting the search option again, you'll be able to see the list of channels again on the screen and you can reselect the channels. So it's useful if you need to connect to multiple BTXs. In addition, after long pressing the center button, it will give you the option to research, exit this menu or just exit the app and return to the video. Now look what happens after turning on my Taranis that works on the 2.4 GHz band. Welcome to OpenTX. You can see that we had some interruptions and when getting closer to the VTX, the video starts to break out. Actually, we can point out the antenna. Also on the receiver, you can see on the receiver, the interference is pretty strong. And that's the reason that if you're going to decide to go with the 2.4 gigahertz video system, you will have to switch your radio system to a different band and you will probably go with either the TBS Crossfire or with the FRSky R9 system. Now, before wrapping up this video, I would like to go over some calculations using the Menos C range calculator. So in this range calculator, you can enter the VTX power in millivert, select the operating frequency. We can also select the antennas types and polarization. I'm not going to touch these values, so I'm just going to leave it the way it is. And then it's going to show you the range in meters, kilometers, and in miles under optimal conditions. So look what happens when I change the VTX power between 200 millivolts to 400 millivolts. First of all, when it's set to 200 millivolts using the 5.8 gigahertz band, the maximum range in meters is 970 meters. But when you are changing it to 400 millivolts, you can see that the range is not going to be doubled. And the reason for that is that the maximum range is going to be multiplied by the square root of the ratio between the new VTX power and the old one, which means that if we divide 400 by 200, it's two. So the 970 meters that we saw before is going to be multiplied by the square root of 2, which means that if you want to double the maximum range, we will have to set the VTX power to 800 millivolts. So after selecting 800 millivolts, you can see now that the maximum range is 1930 meters. But look what happens when we change the operating frequency between 5.8 to 2.4. So let's set it to 200 millivolt. And you can see that when we're using 200 millivolts VTX power and we change it to 2.4, it's going to be changed to 2330 meters. And the reason for that is that the maximum range that we can achieve is going to be multiplied by one divided to the ratio between the new frequency and the old one, which sounds a little bit complicated, but it's not. So let's say for just for easier calculations that if it's 5.8 and this was 2.9, so when we change between 5.8 to 2.9, the distance is going to be doubled because 5.8 divided to 2.9 is 2. So 5.8 divided to 2.4 is almost 2.5, which means that when we change the operating frequency between 5.8 to 2.4, the maximum distance is going to be multiplied by 2.5. So the maximum VTX according to Furious FEV is 800 millivolts, but we measured about 500. So let's enter 500 millivolts. So when it's set to 500 millivolts under 2.4 gigahertz band, we can achieve a maximum range of 3.69 kilometers. In order to achieve the same range using 5.8 gigahertz band, we will have to use almost three watts of power, which is crazy. And the VTX is probably going to get to 200 degrees Celsius. And this is probably impossible for you to put a three watt VTX on your mini quadcopter. But as you could see before, the VTX on free of FB that operates on the 2.4 gigahertz band is not that big. So if you're thinking, why should you bother with all the process? That's why it's just going to extend your range into much farther that you could potentially reach using the 5.8 gigahertz system. Now, of course, switching to the 2.4 gigahertz VTX and RX system has some downsides. First of all, it's expensive. You will have to buy this system and also switch your radio system if you haven't done it already and everything adds up and you will need to spend a lot of money. Second of all, the antennas are bigger and also more fragile. So imagine that if you're going to put it on your mini quadcopter and crash it, probably the antenna is not going to survive. And at the price of $20, it's not going to be a cheap crash. 
and you will have to also buy more of these antennas. In addition, the problem with the 2.4 GHz band that it is very populated. Wi-Fi networks are using this band and if you're going to fly inside a city, you might have some issues because, as I said, the band is very populated and it will cause interferences. However, if you want to do long range flying out of the open, I think that this system is going to be great and I'm really looking forward to see how it's going to perform when I'm going to finally test it out, which will be probably in the next couple of weeks. So I hope my explanation was informative enough. Of course, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comment section down below. Don't forget to leave a thumbs up if you like this video and consider subscribing to my channel and hitting the notification bell if you're not already subscribed. See you on my next videos and goodbye.